dealing with a man who is the greatest figure in the history of British sport. I don't think there's ever been a greater manager than Steve. I was frankly in a degree of awe and trepidation speaking to him. When he came into room, sort of people noticed he came into room, and when he spoke, people listened. He speaks to a kind of myth of Scotland, of the shipyards, of Lanarkshire, a character, if you like, hewn from the, the, the coalface. Steen was much more than just a football genius. I mean, he was a man with a very rounded social and political awareness. Oh, the crowd love it! He made Celtic from a team with great potential into a magnificent giant. <laughs> Jock Steen would barely recognize Burn Bank these days. The house in Glasgow Road where he was born 85 years ago is long gone. Gone is the cross where the men of the village would meet. Gone too are the mines, taking with them the symbols of Jock's industrial past. Jock's whole view of life was inseparable from his mining background. You know, Jock was the son of a miner who was the son of a miner. So he's very much a figure of Scotland when coal was king, uh, when steel and the shipyards were at their epic height, and much of the kind of values that he brought to management were, were framed in that era. Well, Steen had the absolutely typical Lanarkshire upbringing. He was either going to play football or he was going down the mines. Jock was 15 when he first went down the pits, but his real ambition was to play professional football. His career began at Blantyre, Victoria, where his father, George, was on the committee. The Vicks played in the colours of Rangers, and as the Steen family's allegiance lay with the Ibrox club, they no doubt hoped that one day the Jurors would call for jock services. Instead, it was Second Division Albion Rovers who came calling, and in 1942, 20-year-old Jock Steen signed as a semi-professional. Conditions in wartime football were bleak and Jock would often turn up for a match straight from a shift down the mine. But it soon became clear that Steen was made of different stuff. They played a game against Celtic in which they were 3-0 down. He was like a man standing on the bridge of the ship and it was sinking slowly and people thrashing around and he was holding the side together and got back to being 3 all. His qualities were evident, and he was soon made captain of the side. But after eight seasons of hard graft on the pitch and down the mine, Jock had become disillusioned with his life in Scotland. Out of the blue came a pal of his, Dougie Wallace, and said, you want to go down to Wales? So what he did was away and played for a non-league club, Trinetley. But after two seasons playing for the non-league side, the Steen family became homesick. Jock thought about giving up football altogether and going back to being a miner, when unbelievably he got a call from a big Glasgow club. But it wasn't Rangers. Robert Kelly and Jimmy Gribbon remember me playing with Albion Rovers, and I think it was in the papers that I was wanting back home. And when he came back, of course, he was a tremendous pillar of a very successful team. It was a dream move. But how would it go down with his family and friends back in Burn Bank? Steen himself once said to me, he said, we weren't, we weren't orange, but we were staunch. And people in Scotland know those uh, gradations of definition. I was A lot of people he worked with in the pits thought that he had done something dastardly when he joined Celtic. I mean, I remember one <laughs> big guy. And he said, no, no, no doubt about it. Turncoat, an absolute turncoat as far as we were concerned. Lots of people thought that was the last thing I should do. But Scotland's a hard place to lay down bigotry in, isn't it? I've lost quite a few friends through the year too. But if you have to get friends that way, they're not really friends. So they didn't, they didn't mind to talk too much of a voice. But Celtic in 1951 was a team in crisis, and an ageing journeyman footballer wasn't exactly the solution the fans and players had in mind. Imagine bringing an old player like that in. I was fairly good in the air, but I wasn't exceptional as a player, no. Just ordinary, very ordinary. There was no fancy dance stuff about him. It was a phrase he used himself once or twice, you know. Chuck once described himself as booting the ball the way he was facing at the time. 
But he established himself and age didn't really matter because his reading of the game was unbelievable. Again, Jock was made club captain. He could put his finger on things a lot quicker than the rest of us. He knew the game from A to Z and he was worth listening to because what he said we found out, you know, was, was right. For Jock, the good times kept on coming. Celtic won the Coronation Cup in 1953 and a year later they won the league and cup double. But an ankle injury ended his playing career and it was decided to put him in charge of the reserves. He would seal his reputation with players like Billy McNeil, Bertie Old, Stevie Chalmers, Bobby Lennox, John Clark and Tommy Gemmell, some of whom were in that reserve side. Down to Big Jock that uh, I went to Celtic. Um, he came out to my mum and dad's house in Belsill and finished up saying to my mother and father, if he's ever cheeky, is it all right for me to scalp him? Success came quickly to Jock's reserve side, but when his promotion came, it wasn't at Celtic. I was a non-Catholic, and maybe they felt that maybe I wouldn't achieve the job as manager, but I moved out to try and prove that I could be a manager, and I did try it in Fairland. With only six games of the season left, taking over at the struggling Dunfermline would be a real test of his management skills. Oh, we in a bad situation. We were uh, going for relegation, to be honest. And uh, it was only when Big Jock came and didn't only organise the team, but organised the actual club itself, you know. He'd seen us a couple of times, he'd seen what was going wrong, so he took us down onto the park and showed us where we were going wrong. Nobody ever did that before with us. Steen's Dunfermline won their last six games and avoided relegation. The following season, he took them to the Scottish Cup final for the first time in their history, where they beat his old club, Celtic. I've never seen such a bunch of sand boys. And that's Jock Steen coming in. And I remember when the final whistle went, so he disappeared. And when we came in, he was in the bath. Still had his coat on. <laughs> and he was happy. <laughs> Jock's reputation was growing, and he was looking for a bigger stage. His next challenge was in European competition against one of the top English clubs, Everton. There'd been a quote in the evening citizen, who are those country cousins or something, you know, somebody down at Everton, I said, who? Them fell, man, never heard of them. So Big Jock never did anything, but he came in on the Monday morning, he just walked right up to the notice board and pinned this thing up in the notice board. He walked out. And he says, what's this? Because usually only the team sheets that go up on the notice board. And, of course, I got everybody's dander up, you know. And uh, that was enough to beat them. <laughs> That's the psychology of the man. Always keen to learn, Jock travelled to Italy to meet up with celebrated coach Helenio Herrera, who was also using modern management techniques to mould his new Inter Milan side. In 1964, Jock left Dunfermline for a brief but successful spell at Hibernian. Meanwhile, at Celtic Park, there was little to cheer, and it was clear that the board couldn't afford to ignore their former captain. But there was a stumbling block. Essentially, the chairman, Bob Kelly, picked the team. So, from the board's point of view, the change involved in bringing in Jock Steen was not just about changing a manager, but actually giving up you know, this ludicrous power over the playing side of the club that Bob Kelly exercised. And give it up he did, in order to secure the services of Steen. Jock now held a special place in Celtic's history. <laughs> Jock used to say once he was appointed, 25% of our managers have been Protestants, you know, because <laughs> there are only four of them. My own feeling is that, that Jock loved the idea of uh, managing Celtic. I think he loved it even more because it was a Protestant managing Celtic. He hated, uh, I mean, he, he really did hate the bigotry. I don't think anyone other than him had the strength no, and the character to go in and just say, no, uh, I'm not taking half of this. Yeah, he changed the, system, right. the whole system. Didn't he? The whole pack. He changed yeah. the whole system. The time that he came back, he was much more assured and he had proved to himself that he could be a first-team manager. You know, normally our, our midfield men, Bobby and Bertie, Celtic Park was a great place to be at that time. Every day he went to train, it was great and it was different and, and everybody was always chirpy and happy. If a few did a good result, he would put his arm about you and say, by the way, you're going well, you know. There was never any negativity about it. He was always positive about different things. And he, he, by the time he went out onto the pitch, you were ready for the game. Corner 
Within two months of his arrival in 1965, Jock brought a trophy to Celtic Park for the first time in seven years. It's a good win. It's a goal. A goal by McNeil. Billy McNeil has scored. I think that was a key moment when we won the cup that day. On that particular occasion, it broke a barrier for lots of players. They had all losers' medals. They had nothing to look at as a winner. And they possibly felt that once they had reached this peak and got over the peak of winning something, there were other things to be won. But Steen knew that there was another hurdle his developing team had to overcome. The next season for me was a, a catalyst to our success. We played Rangers in the League yeah, Cup final. Right, big, now, that Yogi's you know, in this, in this country, yeah. if you can't beat Rangers, oh, you're I know. never going to win anything. Sure, yeah, that, we had to prove that we could beat them, and yeah. we beat them that day. That was the game that he loved to win. It was almost as if he had to show the Celtic fans that he could beat Rangers. We won it 2-1, and that was us on our way. For Jock Steen Celtic, the following season was as successful a campaign as any football club has ever experienced. Celtic had not only been seeing off the opposition in Scotland, but in Europe too. And it's a goal by Walters! Jock had taken his players all the way to the European Cup final, where they would face an Inter Milan side coached by his old acquaintance, Helenio Herrera. The Italians had won two of the previous three European Cups and were the masters of the Catanaccio style of defensive football. By contrast, it was Celtic's first European Cup. This was the highest level Jock's management had so far been tested at, and he worked hard to reduce the pressure on his players by keeping things low-key and light-hearted. When you get close to that moment, obviously, these men begin to suffer uh, nerves, and uh, Jock was very good at handling that. He was making all kinds of daft jokes, you know, but the effect on the local Catholic churches of Celtic arriving there, you know, saying, they tell me the 9 o'clock mass and the 10 o'clock mass were all ticket and all that carry on. But do you remember Jock's team talk, what he did, he lifted the up. Oh, he sure. gave, didn't sure. he? I mean, we always played with a smell. In the dressing room, always, we had this shouting and bawling, and, right. and, and we were jeeing or something. But I think the most important thing was that he just turned around and he, he made his... He said, so you're coming here, you've made history. Go out and play your capability and enjoy yourself. Well, that's what Jock said to his players, but he had higher ambitions for this historic afternoon in Lisbon. Jock had said to me before that final, we're not just going to try to win it. He said, we're going to try to win it in a way that makes neutrals glad we won it. He said, makes people proud of us. He said, that's an obligation. I thought that was terrific. After the match, I just happened to get alongside Bill, Bill Shankly, and Bill said, let's go and try to get into the dressing room. Because I remember Jock, it was, I think he'd just come out of the bath, he was sweating as much as the players, and he was Hugh McLevenny, and I said, Jock, you're immortal now. When I got to him in the company of the great Bill Shankly, he, was just, he just kept saying, what a performance, what a performance, and he had visualised a Celtic team playing like that on such an occasion against such opposition. And the fact that he'd seen it as a reality, uh, you know, Jock was excited. To the depths of his being. This old Portuguese guy came up and said, that is the true football.